Ladies and gentlemen, and now missing the arrival of His Royal Highness, the Regent of Pahang Crown Prince Tengku Hassanal Ibrahim Alam Shah Ibn Al Mar Ibn Al Sultan Abdullah Riayatuddin Al Mustafa Bila Shah, accompanied by Tan Sri Zakri and Datuk Sri I.R. Dr. Zain Yujang. Please be seated. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. His Royal Highness, the Regent of Pahang Crown Prince Tunku Hassan Al Ibrahim Al Shah Ibn Al Mar Al Sultan Abdullah Riayatuddin Al Mustafa Bila Shah. Yang berbahagia, Tan Sri Zakri Abdul Hamid, Special Representative on Climate Change to the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Datuk Sri I.R. Dr. Zaini Ujang, Secretary General of the Ministry of Environment and Water Malaysia. Mr. Faisal Parish, Director of Global Environment Center, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the side event on multi-stakeholder partnerships for sustainable peatland management to address climate change in Malaysia. This forum is co-hosted by the Government of Malaysia and the Global Environment Center GEC and supported by the International Fund for Agricultural Development IFAD. The event will showcase action being taken by different stakeholders to support peatland protection and management in Malaysia. For your information, the side event is also being live streamed via the Ministry of Environment and Water CASA Facebook page. So do please invite other participants who would be interested to join this event online. To set the stage for our discussion for today, please welcome Tan Sri Zakri Abdul Hamid, our Special Representative on Climate Change to, to the Prime Minister of Malaysia to the stage to deliver the welcoming remarks. Please welcome. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Is Royal Highness, the Regent of Pahang, Crown Prince Tunku Hassan Al Ibrahim Alam Shah, Ibn Al Sultan Abdullah Riyatuddin Al Mustafa Bilah Shah, Yang Berbahagia Datuk Seri Engineer Dr Zaini Ujang, Secretary General Ministry of Environment and Water, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. We are here together at the annual UN Climate Change Conference in the beautiful city of Sham El Sheikh. Your Royal Highness, the region of Pahang, we feel very grateful and honored by your presence at the Malaysia Pavilion. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our fifth day here since the opening of the UNFCCC COP27. The Malaysia Pavilion has successfully organized 12 sessions of climate talks for the past two days. Although this is the third time that Malaysia has its own pavilion at COP, the first and second was, were in 2016 and 2017 at Marrakesh and Bonn. This is the first time that Malaysia is hosting a pavilion through the public-private partnership concept and bringing the biggest number of Malaysian delegations ever at COP with a total number of 140 participants from Malaysia. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. During the opening speech of COP27, His Excellency Shukri, COP27 President, called on all parties to urgently deliver their climate promises and to focus the world's attention on key elements that will address some of the most fundamental needs of people, including water security, food security, health and energy security. Ladies and gentlemen, peatland ecosystems or Tanah Gambut 
are one of the most important ecosystems globally for carbon storage and climate mitigation. Peatlands store 30% of all soil carbon and more carbon than the biomass of all the world's forests combined. It's just uh, awesome, isn't it? What uh, peat can do for our life. So, ladies and gentlemen, protection, rehabilitation, and sustainable management of peatlands is thus uh, essential for reducing GHG emissions at the global, national, and local levels. You may know that Malaysia has an estimated 2.6 million hectares of peatlands representing nearly 8% of our land and more than 10% of all the peatlands in Southeast Asia. It is one of our largest and most important carbon stores. Ladies and gentlemen, originally almost all of the peatland was covered with the rich tropical peat swamp forests of global significance for biodiversity, including a large number of unique and endemic species. Peatland ecosystems also provide very important ecosystem services, including water supply, flood control, prevention of saline intrusion, as well as support the welfare of our indigenous and local communities, or orang asli or orang asal. Now, you will recall in the 50s, peatlands are wasteland. The management of these areas is draining them and then convert them to better utilization. So with the advent of climate change, the prescribed management contributes to CO2 emissions, which reduce the soil carbon stocks. Hence, ladies and gentlemen, we have two issues. One is to rehab the degraded areas, and secondly, protect the remaining pitlands. In this regard, the government has recognized these issues are enhancing protection and restoration of peatlands. You may also know that in 2019, the National Land Council has stopped approval of, for any further deve development of oil palm on peatlands. And in this context also, the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil Standard has been helping in enhancing uh, management practices to reduce peatland degradation and uh, emission. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the critical aspects of peatland management is that we must take a landscape approach with the engagement of multiple stakeholders from national and state government, governments to private sector and NGOs to local communities and indigenous people. In Malaysia, land is a state matter and so the lead responsibility for peatland management lies with the state governments. It is therefore very appropriate that we have been honoured with the presence of His Royal Highness, the region of Pahang, Crown Prince Tunku Hassanal, who will deliver his opening address for the event. I'm also very pleased to show uh, to share with all of you uh, His Royal Highness 
commitment, deep commitment towards conservation and protection of natural uh, resources. He has so many stories to tell, but there will be another day, another day Tuan Ku. Yeah? So, uh, we are very honoured and delighted to have you here. And uh, I would also like to thank the uh, speakers who will be participating. In particular, I would like to thank the Global Environment Centre under the able leadership of Faisal Parish for organising this event in partnership with the Ministry of Environment and Water as well as the International Fund for Agriculture Development for supporting the event. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and thank you. Thank you, Yang Bahabagi and Tan Sri Zakir for those insightful remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are delighted to be graced with the presence of His Royal Highness. So without further delay, we would like to invite His Royal Highness, the Regent of Pahang from Prince Tunku Hassanal to deliver an opening address. Please welcome. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a warm welcome to everybody. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to congratulate everyone for successfully being here at COP27. Your presence here proves your individual responsibility to tackle this climate change together. And also, I would like to thank the government of Malaysia for hosting us in the Malaysian Pavilion, the Global Environment Center for organizing the event, and the International Fund for Agricultural Development for supporting the program. The peatland ecosystems is the most important terrestrial ecosystem globally for carbon storage. Although peatlands only cover 3% of the land surface, they store about 30% of soil carbon, which is more than the biomass of all the world's forests combined. Southeast Asia has about 23 million hectares of peatlands, or about 40% of tropical peatlands globally, of which an estimated 2.6 million hectares of peatlands are in Malaysia. One hectare of peat swamp forests may store up to 5,000 tons of carbon or more than 10 times the carbon store of tropical forests on mineral soil. Because peatlands are critical in global carbon storage, degradation of peatlands can lead to large-scale emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. It is estimated that global emissions from peatlands degradation is more than 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide a year or about 30% of global GHG emissions from the forestry and land use sector. In Malaysia, more than 50% of our peatlands have been cleared and drained for agriculture and plantations over the past 50 years, and a large portion of our remaining peat swamp forests have been logged. More than 200,000 hectares of our peatlands have been identified as fire prone. Malaysia has recognized the importance of stopping further degradation of peatlands and managing its peatland on a sustainable basis. Work to re-wet and restore degraded peat swamp forests in Malaysia started in 2008 and is now being conducted in more than 10 sites covering nearly 6,000 hectares. In 2021, Malaysia set a national target of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and our nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement enhanced to a 45% reduction of GHG intensity by 2050. At COP26 in Glasgow, 141 nations committed to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030. If we are going to meet our targets, we need to scale up our actions in every country. We also need to take a whole-of-society approach. We need to engage stakeholders from all levels of 
from the private sector, state governments and national governments, consumers as well as the indigenous people and local communities. All must work together to achieve the common goals of restoring our forests and peatlands and reducing GHG emissions. The Indigenous People and Local Communities, or IPLC, have been the stewards of the land for thousands of years and their active engagement in preventing and reversing forests and peatland degradation is essential. The recent report on the state of Indigenous peoples and local communities, lands and territories confirmed that IPLCs are vital custodians of the world's remaining natural landscapes. In total, 42% of all global lands in good ecological condition are within IPLC lands, and 91% of IPLC lands are in good or moderate ecological condition. In my own state of Pahang, we are blessed with the largest forest cover and the largest area of peatland in Peninsular Malaysia. In recent years, a number of actions have been undertaken to better protect peatlands and forests in Pahang, including the establishment of the Pahang State Parks Corporation and the Pahang Biodiversity Council to better conserve natural ecosystems and biodiversity, undertaking a pilot project for re-wetting and fire prevention for 17,000 hectares of peatlands in Pekan, in partnership with the state government agencies, local indigenous communities, oil palm plantations and NGOs. We're also initiating a project to support the development of a state action plan on peatlands and prepare an integrated management plan for the Southeast Pahang peatland landscape and also initiating a carbon study on, of peat som forests in Southeast Pahang and lowland forests in the Tukai region to explore options for better protection and rehabilitation of forests and peatlands. And currently, as we speak, the state of Pahang is, set, is in the midst of setting up a Royal Tiger Park next to Tamanagara, our national park, where we have nearly about 40 tigers over there. Moving forward, we are encouraging the state government, private sector, local communities and NGOs to enhance and scale up collaborative work to better protect and restore peatlands and forests in the state. Today, we are here gathered to share information and discuss further how to develop multiple stakeholder partnerships to conserve and sustainably manage peatlands and forests to reduce GHG emissions and support welfare of indigenous people and local communities in Malaysia. I hope that everyone attending today will play a vital role in spreading the message of the importance of action to urgently protect and restore our remaining peatlands and forests for the important roles for carbon storage, water management and biodiversity cons uh, conservation and as well as sustaining the lives of the people. With this, I formally open the study event on the multi-stakeholder partnerships for sustainable peatland management to address climate change in Malaysia. Thank you all. I would like to invite Tanshri Zakri to present the token on behalf of the Malaysia government. Now I would like to invite Mr. Faisal Parrish. Sorry. I'd like to invite Mr. Faisal Parrish for another token of appreciation. Sorry.
Sorry. Just to share just now, uh, the token of appreciation uh, as presented by Mr. Faisal Parish is by Shak Koyok, an indigenous people's artist from Malaysia, which is on the title Portrait of Paranti Tree, which is a peat swamp forest tree painted by Shak Koyok. Thank you once again to Mr. Shak Koyok. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would now like to hand over the floor to Ms. Adeline Tan to continue with the rest of our panel of discussion. Please welcome. Good afternoon, Your Royal Highness, Tan Sri, Dato Sri, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Evelyn Tan and I will be the MC for the plenary session. So as mentioned this morning, this forum aims to discuss the strategies to halt massive peatland, forests and land fires in Southeast Asia by securing multi-stakeholder partnerships and USD 1.5 billion to finance sustainable low emission land management in ASEAN. Let me now welcome uh, Mr. Faisal Parish, Director of Global Environment Center and the lead person in the Take SMPEM program to present on potential greenhouse gas emission reduction through rehabilitation of Southeast Asia Paham peat swamp forest. Let me introduce uh, Mr. Faisal. Since 1995, Faisal has been diligently addressing the issue of transboundary haze in the ASEAN region and has worked with ASEAN Secretariat since 2000 to establish the ASEAN Peatland Management Strategy 2006 to 2020 and the ASEAN Program on Sustainable Management of Peat Swamp uh, Peatland Ecosystem 2014 to 2020. All these are the key ASEAN initiatives to address the root cause of transboundary haze. Without further ado, uh, let us welcome on stage Mr. Faiza Parish. Your Royal Highness, Tan Sri, Datuk Sri, ladies and gentlemen, participants both here in Sharm El Sheikh and online, uh, welcome again to this uh, uh, presentation on peat swamp forest conservation in uh, Malaysia. So uh, I will give a uh, short presentation on potential greenhouse gas emission reduction through potential protection and rehabilitation of Southeast Pahang peat swamp forest, which is the largest peat swamp forest in Pahang state in Malaysia. Um, this presentation has been uh, developed uh, in partnership with His Holdings, the Habitat Foundation, NBS, Nature-Based Solutions, and Global Environment Center. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the Southeast Pahang peatland landscape uh, in Pahang State covers 230,000 hectares, including 135,000 hectares of peatlands in the core, surrounded by uh, mineral soils and coastal areas. It's the largest peatland landscape in Malaysia. Uh, in, the, in the center, there are seven permanent forest reserves covering 95,000 hectares. The depth of the peat varies between one meter to seven meters, and it constitutes a major store of carbon. More than 250 million tons of carbon is stored in this landscape. Surrounding the forest, there are plantations, degraded peatlands, 19 Orang Asli or Aboriginal uh, community villages, and uh, community land. Next. So, with. Next, please. Uh, within the landscape uh, in the past, uh, logging or timber extraction did involve the construction of large drainage canals, uh, making the peatland susceptible to fire. And also the area around the forest has been developed for agriculture, also with drainage. 
and this has made a large portion of the landscape quite vulnerable to fire. And in the past uh, 10 to 20 years, there have been very serious fires every year, covering up to 10,000 hectares of peatlands being burned in one year. So uh, in order to address this, next slide please. Uh, His Holdings uh, is currently undertaking an ESG study of the landscape in cooperation with Pahang State Government with technical support from Nature Based Solutions and Global Environment Center. The objective of the study is to develop recommendations for the implementation of ESG projects in the landscape that have positive and additional climate, biodiversity and community outcomes and which may be funded by a sustainable financing mechanism by pursuing high standards of integrity of implementation and certification. The study includes building business study cases for green financing of projects that will enable the conservation of the landscape, reduction of greenhouse gas emission, and maintenance of the carbon stores. So the collection of the information uh, has been undertaken, including the peat depth, the forest, the quality, land use, the network of the drainage and the canals and road network, fire prone areas, indigenous communities and their dependence on the forest and other factors. As we can see in these two images between uh, 2000 and 2022, the area surrounding the forest reserves in dark green has been uh, increasingly uh, developed for plantations, agriculture, aquaculture and other activities. And this has affected the water management within the landscape uh, by uh, draining down the water in the forest edge. And this has been one of the root cause of fire in the past. This is one of the key actions in the future to reduce the regularity of fires and degradation of the landscape. During the, the surveys earlier this year, we've been able to confirm that the landscape is really of global significance for biodiversity. Next, please and a total of 29 mammals, 141 bird species, 38 fish species have been found, including a number of extremely rare and endangered animals. The the local Orang Asli community uh, presented this picture of the tiger uh, being in the landscape. We have also found the hairy-nosed otter and the flat-headed cat, which are two of the most rare mammal species in the whole of Malaysia, extremely rare. We have also found possibly a new species of uh, fish, uh, beta affini omega, within the landscape, which is still under study. And uh, we uh, also have found a lot of other indigenous uh, blackwater fish species. Next, please. Uh, There are also a number of rare uh, and uh, threatened uh, bird and uh, fish and uh, plant species within the landscape. Next. And also during the assessments, we've been uh, uh, interviewing villagers from the 19 uh, Aboriginal indigenous uh, communities in the landscape. And still many of the communities have a significant dependence on non-timber forest products uh, from the forest and also dependent on the water supply for the agriculture land and in some cases drinking water supply coming from the peatland forest. So uh, unfortunately, many of these community members are still in uh, quite a poor situation. They're classified as hardcore poor, uh, and uh, they still uh, need measures to uplift them. And we believe that that can be done by engaging them more actively in the protection and rehabilitation of the landscape. Next slide. So uh, the information gathered will help us uh, develop a management strategy for, for the landscape. Next. And this draws Next slide. And this uh, draws on earlier work which was started in 2017. Can we go back, please? Uh, Work which was started in 2017 as a pilot approach in uh, a number of villages uh, in one portion of the landscape where it has been possible with the assistance of the local uh, uh, Orang Asli community to better protect uh, and to uh, prevent fire in a landscape that previously every few months was burning and the root cause was drainage in the landscape. The drainage was blocked in partnership with the forest department, drainage irrigation department, as well as local local plantation to uh, raise the water level in the landscape and to uh, 
the forest was uh, brought back uh, with assistance from the local community of transplanting trees from some areas into the forest area. Next. And you can see it has transformed from an area which was burning all the time to one where the water level is high, the water is being uh, stored, and the forest is returning. So this has been done on small pilot site, and it's hoped that this can be expanded to the rest of the landscape in the future. Next. So um, there is great potential uh, for the intervention through uh, ESG projects in partnership with the private sector and others. And we've identified many of the sustainable development goals that could be addressed uh, by action in the landscape by having a multi-stakeholder partnership uh, from the government with the private sector, with the local community uh, and other stakeholders to work together uh, to restore the landscape. Next. So the key requirements for greenhouse gas emission project are identification of appropriate uh, methodologies uh, for uh, credit mechanisms, uh, look at eligibility, simulation of the reduction over a period of 30 years, and uh, uh, ensure uh, project area additionality and other factors. Uh, so the next, please. The project has undertaken an assessment of the above ground biomass changes over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, next, and then developed a theory of change uh, which has identified the key uh, underlying risks, direct threats, uh, the key intervention acti activities uh, leading to the overall project objectives. Next. As a result of this, initial calculations have indicated for a small area, a portion of their landscape, about 17,000 hectares, that it could uh, generate emission reductions of up to uh, just under 15 million tons of CO2 could be reduced by an effort to prevent the fire and restore back the forest in this area. So that uh, uh, is still in the process of final verification. But if that is applied across the broad, uh, bigger landscape, that could lead to very significant emission reductions uh, in, in that area, which could also uh, enable the contribution and uh, support of different uh, uh, players to enable the sustainable management as well as the improved livelihood of the indigenous and local community. Next, the uh, next steps are to finalize the study. This is being completed by the end of the year uh, to uh, confirm the different management scenarios and discuss those with the related state agencies, develop appropriate institutional and legal frameworks, uh, undertake the process of free prior and informed consent with the local community and uh, to uh, uh, secure and identify and secure investors who would then support the landscape management over the coming uh, 30 year uh, to reduce emissions and restore back uh, the degraded forest lands. With that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And we hope that the forest will continue to be like this uh, with the help of all of the stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Faiza, for an insightful presentation. Allow me to introduce uh, the next speaker for today, Mr. David Ramos, uh, Senior Manager in Corporate Sustainability of uh, HSBC Bank. So, uh, Mr. Ramos is a sustainability practitioner who has worked in consultancy companies linked to sectors including manufacturing and chemical. With uh, seven years of experience in the finance sector in the Middle East, he currently oversees the bank's corporate sustainability in Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey. Uh, please join me, uh, Mr. David, to the stage to share his uh, the finance sector role in supporting peatland conservation and nature-based solution. Mr. Uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for your, for your Royal Highness and esteemed guests. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Is it fine there? Okay. Thank you. So uh, you might wonder why is HSBC in this panel talking about biodiversity conservation of peatlands. I have to say as a disclaimer probably that I am part of the sustainability team in the Middle East. I'm representing my colleagues that are managing this project and of course they do have all the knowledge. But uh, I wanted to give a little bit of an overall perspective of where does this local project in Malaysia uh, is actually placed on a global scale in HSBC. Um, if we can go to the next one please. 
Uh, this project is part of a global initiative that is called the Climate Solutions Partnership, which is a five-year and $100 million philanthropic commitment of HSBC that focuses on three areas that you can see in there, uh, innovation around climate change, energy transition in Asia Pacific as well, but uh, particularly as well on nature-based solutions, which is the one that brings us here. Um, we we want to uh, we we have a role as a financial institution of attracting capital to uh, advance in the transition to a low carbon economy and protect biodiversity, and we want to do that with nature-based solutions by demonstrating that actually uh, we nature-based solutions can be uh, profitable. We are not just relying on philanthropic or concessional finance to address uh, or restore biodiversity. We want to be able to demonstrate that there is a, a potential economic value uh, of those ecosystems to be protected. Uh, so that's why what you see about the KPIs that you can see in here, many of those, they include the economic value of the, of the activities that we are carrying out, as well uh, jobs creation, uh, of course, carbon sequestration, absolutely, but we want to bring that business angle into the projects that we are supporting with philanthropic funds. If we can go to the next one, please. Uh, so, well, a small definition of nature-based solutions, probably you all know what it is. I don't need to repeat it again. But uh, what is important here is that uh, this is a, a, a global program for us, and, and you'll see later how many projects are, uh, are we supporting. But the important part is that what we are looking for projects that can be scalable. We are looking for projects that can be measurable, that is very easy to extract information and can be demonstration projects that we can actually showcase as a global example of success. Uh, we need to, of course, focus on addressing those KPIs that you were seeing before, and we are asking all of our partners uh, around the world that they, they have a very strong focus on, on achieving those targets that I, we know they are very ambitious. Uh, in the next slide, you can see uh, we focus mostly on, on those three areas of projects, wetlands and mangroves, uh, regenerative agriculture and forest, and we have, the, the number is not correct up there, I think we have now uh, around 40 projects globally that we are supporting with almost 40 million dollars that we are putting on the table for those projects. Uh, with with a variety of partners around the world. Yes, thank you. Uh, but you can get an idea that this is a really a, a global scale project for HSBC. Uh, on the next one, you can see a few of the projects, uh, not all of them, because the ones that are showcasing here is what we call the flagship projects. And this is important because for us, uh, when the project was developed at a global scale, we acknowledge that there are certain areas that are of higher importance for HSBC, and those areas in, or those projects in those areas, they receive additional funding from a central, a central pot of money, let's say. But we can also develop a lot of projects uh, with local funding that we already had. HSBC has been for the last. 20 years, I could say probably, uh, we've been committing between 100 and 150 million in average of uh, concessional finance for a variety of projects with, with working with NGOs and non-for-profit organizations. Um, okay, so the restoration of the North Selangor Pit Swamp Forest through community-based peatland water management rehabilitation by a nature-based solutions. That's quite a title, and, and I entitles a lot of activities in Sarah. I, I, from what I've been, obviously I was not involved in the implementation of this project, but uh, they've been giving me a lot of information about it, and I think it's a great example of success. Um, I was reading a little bit of background, and I, I read that 20,000 hectares of peatlands have been lost or destroyed or degraded since uh, 1997, and 40,000 of those are actually on the vicinity of this area, of the North Selangor area. So I think this is a very important area. And you can see in, in there some of the activities uh, at the bottom of those images, some of the kind of summary of activities that this project entitles, with uh, forest patrolling, with making sure that we are protecting, planting, uh, the canal blocking so we can re-wet the, the areas. And, and all of those activities that we know are important for restoration uh, projects of peatlands. Um, the project components, uh, component one and two, they are mostly, the, I think, all of the nature-based solutions projects, they, have, they need to have a very strong 
community involvement component. And I think this project is the focus from what I see in, in the information that they're giving me. The focus is really there. Uh, we want to involve the local communities. We want to generate uh, different uh, income streams to the local communities with this project. And we want to make sure that they understand the value of the forest that we are asking them to protect. Uh, and, and they don't fall into the mistakes of destroying it because they can think they can, it can be exploited in a, in a different, more unsustainable way. Um, so this project, as a nature-based solution project within the Climate Solutions Partnership that I was talking about, started uh, a couple of years ago, but we have been supporting this area and projects on this area before for more than 10 years. Uh, from uh, what I understand, we have contributed more than $700,000 in restoration activities in this project with the Global Environment Center. And also, uh, just since we started with the Nature Based Solutions, we have supported with $170,000 uh, on those areas. And what is it happening? What are we actually doing? If we go to the next one. So, uh, we are tackling around 100 areas, 100, 100, 100 hectares in this area. We are re-wetting that by blocking canals. Of course, we know that the, the peatland has to be wet, has, the tables have to be high, so that we don't fall in what uh, Faisal was saying before of forest fires and degradation of the peatland. So we are doing that activity of re-wetting. And then once we do that, we have planted uh, 51,000 trees, which uh, have a seven 75% success rate, which I think is, is a very high rate for plantation of trees. Uh, we involve as well the local community and other volunteers with 21,000 volunteers. And I think it's a huge success that they haven't had in five years any fire in that area. That really proves that the project is working. Uh, you can see here some of the activities. The, the nursery on, on the bottom side is actually generating extra income for the community, so we can actually validate that. Uh, we can actually help them develop that income. And uh, other activities in there, the role of volunteers with local schools educating the kids from the very beginning so they understand the value of those ecosystems uh, through that uh, volunteering program that, uh, that they have. And also our colleagues, they, they support in, in the country as much as they can with our own volunteering activities. Um, yeah, we can go to the next one. So what, what are we going to do next? We, of course, we are going to continue the implementation. As I said, the Climate Solutions Partnership goes until 2025. But for us, it's very important that we set the foundations for projects to continue afterwards. Uh, we might be not more funding available from HSBC for this specific area, because we understand we need to diversify where are we investing. But uh, we put a lot of effort and stress in our partners that they need to find alternative sources of income or revenue for those projects so they can continue after work. That could be through monetizing the, the environment that we are, being, we are restoring or through actually demonstrating the economic value for the country and maybe later use financial mechanisms to raise capital, uh, attract investors' money to, to, this, to this area. Um, we want to benefit an additional 200 local community members. We want to launch again this Pitland Forest range that is very successful with the local schools. Um, of course, we want to continue, I didn't say it before, but this is a collaboration with the Selangor State Forestry Department, and we want to continue the empowerment of, of, of this institution. Thank you. That's all for me. Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, David, for the extensive presentation from the finance perspective. Um, our third speaker for today is uh, Mr. Shah Koyo, uh, an indigenous peoples and also artist from Malaysia. So, um, Shah is an award-winning contemporary artist best known for merging art and activism. Hails from the indigenous Temuan Orang Asli tribe in southwest state of uh, Selangor. His passion for and pursuit of art began during his school days, but it was the traumatic encounter with a land a developer encroaching a jungle near his village that fueled his passion to fight for his people's land rights through his artwork. So on that note, uh, join me in welcoming on stage uh, Mr. Sharp Koyo. Thank you, MC. Your, your Royal Highness, Tan Sri and Datu Sri, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today. Next. Indigenous people, uh, I'm focusing on uh, indigenous people in the peninsula, it's called Karasli, culture 
and traditional knowledge and pinland conservation in Malaysia. So here, um, this is the picture of my uh, relative. Basically, all on in the middle there is this picture of my nephew and is my uncle. And here is show that the indigenous people of Malaysia are known um, um, as our Rasli in Peninsula, and we, we are the poorest and the most vulnerable pe people in Malaysia with a poor healthcare and education level. And we, and honestly, in the forest is very close tied together. We living as a, as a, as a family, and we have as natural resources such as bamboo, rattan, herbal medicines, and wild games for the forest. And forest is our ancestral land, customary land. It is a part of our culture. As you can see in the picture itself, the many of our culture is, 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 is tied together with the forest that we live in. Next. Or I say culture in, in nature. So in our cultures, in our this is a part of our ancient cultures view the nature as a part of of an extended ecological family that shares our ancestry and origins, like I mentioned earlier just now, uh, forest and environment is this half a spirit for, for indigenous people. Every time we visit the forest or take something from the forest, we need to ask permission. We need to ask because we believe anything that living has a spirit and we need to respect them. And like many indigenous people around across the world, we're depending on a immediate environment for our living predominantly ancient forests and peatland and I'm, I was uh, I'm feel so lucky because I'm born in near nearby the pit forest I have great memory of swimming in the, in a pit well after coming back from the school and that's actually really tie me to the land that I grew up and that's actually make me uh, uh, so passionate when I try to protect this peatland from from uh, any uh, uh, encroachment. In my particular Tumuan tribe, live on ancient pit land that has recently been under threat from mixed development proposal. Um, and we, um, the best we can to try to stop that uh, happen in, 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 my, in, in Slango state. And globally, peatland look up only about five percent. I think everybody know that already. And often the the plant from the pit forests are used in my community, and for medicinal and building material. This is very crucial because uh, all this knowledge are uh, um, only that elders know. Then, but we need the, the the natural environment to to teach the young generation about. How important our forest, not just just as a uh, environmental value, but also uh, cultural and also medicinal purposes. Because you never know, we we may find a, a cure for cancer in the food forest. And again, uh, ma uh, material from the from the forest are used for traditional indigenous decoration ceremony, like weddings, funeral, ancestral day events. And here is a picture of my, my dad uh, with the blue, blue shirts, and he is a master in uh, in making the fish trap. So I, I I learned how to make the fish trap from him, and then he even sell this fish trap to others to, to know because the, the pit plant itself uh, contain a lot of uh, tropical fish that's a crucial diet for uh, Tumuan people near my village, and uh, we really. Uh, we have a really uh, strong connection to the to the uh, the, the fish in the, in the in pit land as well. So m traditional fishing material are made from the forest from the pit land forest also. And we are uh, also creating uh, songs about uh, the the important uh, about the life near the forest, and uh, we we sang that uh, every once a year on ancestral day, which is which is fall on December. Next, and then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we um, the 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 peatland near Kuala Langat North Forest Reserve was uh, uh, threatened by the proposal to de develop the area, to bulldoze it, to uh, 
to make to make a way for the mixed development pro mixed development projects by the state government, which is Slango State, and we we uh, with, with with many community of Rasli uh, who live around the uh, forest together with sending memorandum to Slango government to stop the forestation projects in 2020. This is earlier, just before COVID-19. And we managed to send the proposal together with our community. We did a street protest. And with that uh, protest actually create so much uh, uh, extension from many public in Malaysia, even internationally known about the case in Kuala Langat North Forest Reserve. And we managed to stop the government of Selangor to um, go away, uh, you know, uh, to, to to destroy the forest. As you can see here, the, the article that um, uh, talk about the, the, the struggle that we have, and then we managed to stop it. And, and this peatland helped sustainable indigenous community and the health of the world. And everybody know about the, the importance of peatland store more carbon than any type of ecosystem. It's that's a very, very huge and uh, the thing everybody needs to do, especially in Malaysia, because the knowledge about the, the important peatland is still not there yet in, among the community that live near the forest. Uh, of course, the important thing is our future, our youth, our children in the school. But, uh, the, the knowledge needs to be there. And the damage peatland, I might just have such greenhouse emission, and I don't want to repeat the same pack again, but here I am together with the community. We um, try um, bring the, uh, the children also to, to teach them about how important the forest to their, to their uh, culture and also to learn about the, the, the knowledge that they don't they didn't learn in the school. And here is a, I, I think everybody needs to know this because it's a global stewardship of inland by indigenous communities are well known around the world. And indigenous people in local communities or IPLC have been stewarded of land for thousands of years. And the active engagement in preventing and reversing forest and peatland degradation is essential. The report of instead of indigenous people on local community lands and territories confirmed that IPLCs are vital custodian on the wall remaining in the natural landscape. But 91% of IPLC lands could be a good or moderate ecological conditions. So uh, IPLC are steward of some of the most important peatlands stored in incoverable carbon globally. So next, here, here you are. This is, this is um, what, what I'm passionate about. And, and the way I, I, I understand the forest is, is totally, I think, um, I try to capture it in my visual artwork because I believe um, when I speak English in my village, nobody know. I will speak uh, Malay language here, I think only a Malaysian will know. So I use the visual as a language, as a new universal language to send the message about how important it is about, about peatland, also how important, how important the indigenous people in in protecting our nature because we believe we are part of nature. And um, um, I think that's it. And thank you so much for your attention. Yes, thank you, Shah, for sharing your community's uh, culture and uh, reliance on peatlands. So um, the last presenter for today is um, Miss Serena Liu, uh, she's the manager of a peatland program from Global Environment Center. Um, Miss, uh, Miss Serena is currently involved in the development of a measurable action for haze-free sustainable land management in Southeast Asia, or in short, we call it MAFSA. She is the key resource person on improved peatland management practices to reduce uh, peatland and forest fire. So, without further ado, allow me to. Uh, make way for Serena to take the stage. Serena. Hello, good afternoon everyone and good evening to those uh, connect uh, online. Um, yeah, I'm being the last uh, speaker and also the lady. 
um, I have the privilege to stand on the platform. <laughs> Okay, so my title um, for this presentation is Community-Based PLM Protection and Reputation in Malaysia. Next, please. So as I mentioned by um, our uh, Royal Highness that uh, Malaysia, we have like, uh, about 2.6 million hectares of uh, PLM uh, across the country. That is about 8% of the total land area. And the largest uh, PLM area is found in Sarawak. This is about 1.4 million hectares. Um, there's actually uh, approximately 30% of uh, total uh, pillar in Malaysia is found in Foro Reserve. Malaysia has recognized its importance of the pillar ecosystem in the country and have been taking actions uh, on improving the protection and sustainable use through the better management practices, BMPs, and also on protection and rehabilitation of the pillar areas. Next, please. So we have been listening about this uh, multi-stakeholder and landscape approach. We very important private um, uh, public and also the community. We work together. We need the government agencies, NGO, CSO, private sector, local community for common protection um, and also good uh, rehabilitation for a common objective. So landscape approach. Why landscape approach? Um, go back one slide, please. So if you can see from the image here, we have plantation, for reserve, degraded land, and also indigenous village in one piece of land. So this is really important that we need to recognize and we need to um, really promote the multi-stakeholder approach and also landscape approach to conserve our peatlands. Next, please. So we know they're very important. We have the policies from the government agency. We have the private sector on development investment. And also we have the community where they are living for um, hundreds of years in the same piece of land. But how? So we need to understand the bottom up and also on the top down system. So from the top down basically is the policies, plans, formulation and implementation. We have a state plans, we have a national plans. We have a regional and international obligations pledges to comply. Then from the um, site level activities for BMP, we need to give a technical support. We need to provide financial support and more support as well. So when we are talking about these uh, partnerships, we need to know how to do it. So it's not just saying that, OK, we have the plan. Please comply with the plan. No, people won't know. Even the community, they don't understand. So we need to have a third party to go in, to educate them, to give them awareness, and to improve their knowledge. Because the challenge that we have in Pahang, specifically, um, or actually, the indigenous people, they don't normally go to school. But how are they you know, aware of the, the, the system uh, services? But of course, from their traditional knowledge, they, they know more than we are. Because we are from a technical perspective, but from them is uh, from the cultural, spiritual um, knowledge. Next, please. So we are talking about sharing benefit from the ecosystem services. Then we need to share the responsibility to protect and also to manage um, the ecosystem. Next, please. So we are talking about four R. What are these four R's? So we have revetting, reduction of fire risk, revegetation, revitalization. This is quite similar to the international uh, Indonesia's concept. Um, how they approach and engage with the local community to improve the management of the pillar ecosystem. And also on the last but not least is the SIPA program. Next please. For the reverting, um, we have been working together with the government agency and also uh, community and private sector to build more check dams or canal blocks uh, in the degraded uh, pillar area. So plantation and community participation are very important because they need to understand the functions of the pitland and then to protect and manage it properly. So we empower not only the community but also the private sector. Of course, we're communicating with the government agencies for a co coordinated collaboration. So we slow down the water flow and also increase the water level. And then that really um, engage the community to help us to um, establish the bezometer and the water level marker. Um, next, please. So for reduction of a fire risk, uh, community members, they are engaged and trained um, for the regular monitoring because we know that government has the challenges when the manpower um, 
scar or maybe not uh, in enough is limited so we train the local community to become our eyes and hands once they spot the small fires they will need to inform us and also to inform the government agencies so that the um, immediate action can be undertaken we also install um, the fire danger waiting uh, signboard uh, to inform about the fire risk to the community so this FDRS information is from the Malaysian Meteorological Dep Department on their website. We disseminate the information through WhatsApp because now I think everyone is very familiar with WhatsApp. Every every time, you know, every day, every minute, people are checking on their messages on WhatsApp. So we also use that platform to engage the community on this. Next, please. So with vegetation, we. Um, engage the community and then we also engage with the plantation estate partners to um, restore the degraded peatland uh, pit by planting fast growing three species Makaranga or the uh, Tengek Burung, uh, Milakop, Luna and Kanda. So that one is the really to create the shade for the trees if we want to plant the timber species because most of the timber species cannot survive on the open area. The community members are engaged in the planting and maintenance of the replanted area. The wildings have been prepared by the community and we promote the seedling buyback uh, program, which we engage the private sector and through the CSR program we buy back the seedlings from the community nurseries and then we plant at the degraded area. Next please. Revitalization. This is more on this a small grant and the training uh, given to the community to improve the livelihood. So we uh, assist them to set up their backyard nursery or the community nurseries. And then this is one of the actions that we promote um, uh, livelihood um, improvement. Um, next, please. The next is the ecotourism. So members are participating in that and then through the river cruise, tree planting program, fishing and jungle trekking. This can be integrated with the homestay and also handicraft. So I, I guess uh, the participant get this uh, handicraft uh, when you see it on the chair. So this is actually from uh, the uh, indigenous community um, handicraft from a Slango. So it's a shaft. A community prepared this uh, handicraft. Next, please. So um, another one that we are working together with the community is um, good agriculture practices. We engage with the Department of Agriculture to provide training on this. So they have a more um, knowledge how to reduce uh, fire risk to improve the soil and productivity and manage farms using sustainable method, not to use the I mean, for the business sector, normally we say business as usual. So for farmers, they also have business as usual, which is the burning to open the land, you know. So um, we engage um, the authority agencies and also to in include uh, community for the sus um, sustainability uh, way to have them to get the certificate. So mind get Malaysian good agriculture practices is one of uh, the certificates. And the other one is the MSPO, the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil Certificate. Next, please. So, SIPA program. What is SIPA? Communication, education, and public awareness. So, um, stakeholder awareness and information sharing at a various level. Uh, we need to do the SIPA program not only for the community, but also to the politician, high level officials, school children, women. Uh, etc. So we have the slogan no left out when we have the COVID time when the government giving out the subsidies. So we also hope that through this sustainable pillar management program also we engage this no left out. It's not only the slogan but also it's really the work out with the different stakeholders. And another thing is when we talk about SIPA, we talk about education. So education not only to the youngster but also re-educate the elderly uh, in the households because normally who are the one burning or clearing the land they are adults so we engage with the youngster so the youngster the children go back home they will they will engage or they will brief the parents not to burn so next please so sustainability strategy for community based pillar protection and rehabilitation um, for the community based organization establishment next please so uh, for the North Lango Pitland 
uh, there is the first registered community-based organization in, in Malaysia. Next, please. So these are some of the uh, photos and the um, activities that we have been uh, undertaken with the uh, school children. Next, please. Next is the gender equality. So we empower the women not necessarily to participate in the heavy work, but also on the kajerengan. Um, so this is the handicraft uh, activity. And next, for the on the key six, uh, messages, uh, we talk about the stakeholder engagement. We talk about the uh, ecosystem protection and reproduction, and also empowerment. All this, uh, we hope that we can. Um, uh, achieve a better a common goal to protect our pillar ecosystem. Next, please. So the sustainable pillar management towards the SDG um, is actually contributing to more than 10 SDG in general. So um, I would like to stop here. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Serena, uh, for the delivery of your presentation. Um, I haven't listened to all who have presented uh, their diverse perspective. We are now uh, going into discussion and Q&A session here. In, uh, we would like to invite uh, all speakers to come on stage to take your seat. So um, we have uh, floor mics available for participants to post your question. So kindly state your name, the country and the organization you represent and uh, please keep your question brief and if possible just two questions at uh, most from each one to enable as many people to fill their question. So So thank you very much uh, everyone for your attendance. Now uh, here's your opportunity to uh, ask questions or make comments uh, related. Please, when you want to give the comment, just introduce briefly your name, where you're from, and uh, to whom you want to ask the question for clarification. The floor is open. Yes, please, on the front. We have a roving microphone. This before, I would like to say thank you for your presentation. And uh, my name is Niken. I'm from Indonesia, but currently working for Sumitomo Forestry in Japan. And we are also manage, managing uh, more than 10,100 peatland in West Kalimantan, Indonesia. And that's why uh, we are very interested with uh, your presentation, especially with uh, Mr. Faisal and uh, we would like to have a collaboration if possible in the future and uh, our question is how did you evaluate the natural capital uh, especially such as biodiversity because uh, we also found that in our areas as also very high biodiversity and then uh, next question is for Mr. David. So we would like to know how do we standardize the criteria for evaluate the natural capital of uh, or forest value? Yeah, that's all my question. Thank you. Uh, let's take one more question before we get the panel to respond. Any more questions? Or otherwise, uh, let's start uh, first with uh, David. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I have an answer for you, unfortunately. Uh, I don't think anybody has, to be honest. Uh, we have, uh, we are involved, HSBC at a global level, we are involved in a lot of activities uh, on valuing nature and having that price tag to nature. We are part of the core team that is developing the task force for nature-related financial disclosures that hopefully that will help advance uh, how companies are disclosing their impact in, in, in nature across different portfolios, not only for financial institutions, but for the company. Uh, so we are very hopeful that that will actually uh, be deployed very soon. 
uh, but I don't think there is uh, there is a clear answer to that. Uh, taxonomies and, and anything related to KPIs to to how are we measuring uh, things in our impacts, let's say, at a global scale, uh, they are complex. There are some successful examples in, in Europe with the with the sustainable finance taxonomy, uh, but it's, it's not an easy answer because the priorities are different for each region, for each country. So the, the value of nature of a peatland in, in Malaysia could be very different of the value of mangroves in UAE where I'm based. So it's very difficult to come up with a standard methodology for valuing that. Obviously, part of this climate solutions partnership, we are trying to do that. Uh, we don't have an answer yet. Hopefully by 2025, we will have more of an answer. And, and the project includes what we call the accelerator that you could see over there, but I didn't have time to talk about it, which is those 40 projects, let's say, that we have globally across different ty type of ecosystems, they can uh, share knowledge among them. All of our partners are part of this global community of practitioners that are sharing knowledge on how to protect and restore nature that hopefully that will inform all of those uh, decision makers on how to set that taxonomy. Thank you, David. Um, your first question was, was about valuing the biodiversity. Actually, that's also a very tricky issue. Um, of course, biodiversity, we can say, has infinite value, uh, but in the financial mechanism, sometimes no value. So how to find the point in between? And I think that some of the schemes which are there uh, for the carbon financing, they also bundle together with uh, other elements such as social benefit and biodiversity benefit. But it's not that you're putting a specific value on the tiger in the landscape or the, the other species, it's the value of that ecosystem as a whole. And then to attract additional funding through the mechanisms. But these mechanisms for financing, for climate change, biodiversity, and other services are still evolving, still developing, and standards are still being uh, developed. And uh, that provides some guidance for the pathway, but it's at the moment it's more a case-by-case -case basis and discussion with the potential uh, funders. Uh, just before I ask for more questions, I think there is a registration sheet going around, a QR code. If you have not filled that in on your phone, please do so before you leave then we will be able to send you the further information on the recording, presentation, and other materials that you may want. So uh, I hope Secretariat can, uh, yeah, is circulating uh, that for people to uh, sign up if you haven't done. Otherwise, you can leave your cards. Um, so can I ask for a second question, another question from the audience uh, to the presenters? Uh, I, have, I have a question. Yeah. Please, sir. Um, uh, in your experience, um, in Malaysia, we're dealing uh, where uh, state government have a really uh, controlled and on a forest matter and a land matter, and then federal have no control to many states in Malaysia. In your experience, how how you deal with the many states? For example, now you you work two states, which is Selangor and Pahang. Are they um, are they other states that have? Um, you found it uh, uh, difficulty, and how you, how do you um, encounter that? Uh, how do you manage to take it through, and how to, and at the same time, uh, how you bring all government come together in one, in one room and try to solve and try to protect the environment. Uh, thank you, Shaq, for your question. Um, maybe I'll ask Serena to uh, comment on on that. But I think one of the fundamental things is how to bring together multiple stakeholders. If you're going to manage a landscape or an ecosystem as complex as peat, we need to have a government, private sector, local community, indigenous people all engaged. And how do you go about doing that in a different uh, situation? I think each situation may be a bit unique, but very important is to convene some sort of stakeholder dialogue and to find some related uh, champion uh, particularly in the government agency, an agency with responsibility for peatland and land matter, or to take as an entry point particular problem like forest fire, like flooding, like other issue which can act as a convening, bringing people together. If you just say, uh, come together to talk about conservation of peatlands, maybe people will not come. But if you say, let's how to solve 
our climate crisis, how to solve the fire, how to solve the flood, then maybe you can convene different stakeholders. And then you must work towards coming with a common common solution. Uh, so thanks. Yeah, from my side, uh, in addition to what Faisal has explained just now, so Malaysia government now has a one project, the sustainable management of peanut ecosystem in Malaysia. So SMPM project funded by Ifat and Jeff uh, Six. So uh, coordinating by um, Ketsa, Kementerian, uh, is the Ministry of uh, um, Energy and also Natural Resources. So there have been the executing agencies to facilitate that implementation of the project. So um, the project is not only looking at the national level for the uh, national action plan on pitlands, but also encourage the state, the project state, the uh, four states we have, Selangor, Pahang, Sabah and Sarawak to have their own state action plan on pitlands. So this is actually to have uh, all the government agencies, the key state agencies, and also uh, from the private sector and community and NGO CSO to work together on this uh, sustainable pillar management. Uh, the main goal is to really um, ta tackle the haze issue in Malaysia. Yeah. So haze is uh, your key word in this conversation. Uh, maybe, Shaq, I can ask you just to elaborate a bit. You mentioned about this success story that you had in your village to protect the uh, peatlands. What are the lessons learned from that that could be adopted by other community? How, why was that a success and other, other uh, similar situations have not been successful? In protecting the uh, environment, especially near the indigenous uh, community, it's quite tough sometimes because uh, many community like I, the uh, like every state they have different rules. And but um, in in Malaysia, it, I'm quite lucky. And we are quite lucky in Kuala Langa North Forest Reserve, actually close to the um, uh, Kuala Lumpur Airport, International Airport, and as well as close to the Sabajaya, Putrajaya, and Kuala Lumpur. And um, well, during the campaign, we managed to get people to to the forest itself, and the 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 the, the fight actually is not just or or honestly not just indigenous people, but all the community, all the pe people around Mal in Malaysia, especially student and uh, young journalists, and also uh, even um, um, hikers, uh, bikers, they come together and go to the forest because. Um, in protecting the, the, the environment that's so strange for them is for me I think the best way is to have them to have a something for them to hold to step on it so they have like a sentimental value and at the same time they have a connection to the land they've been to they say this is beautiful and, uh, and how are we gonna protect it and that actually I think that's why I learned from, from this fight to, to save this forest is uh, bring people together and uh, touch the soil and touch the land, touch the tree and have a breeze away inside the forest. I think that's uh, um, the way for me to, 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 get, to bring all people together and, and to fight and save the, the forest because of course, um, uh, everybody loves to, to do hiking and everywhere around the world, but everyone in, 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 in protecting and in, uh, so in, in saving the forest is quite a tricky process. And I, I, I dealt with so many harassment and so many threats. And, and with, with the community, with, the, with all people I con connected with in social media, even meeting and, and forums, and the, 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 for, uh, I managed to have a re really good moral support from people around, around the world, people in Malaysia. I'm so grateful that um, that's become part of the success story and um, the community have um, so happy that we managed to save the forest. The forest is actually is part of our history, our stories, because the, you, uh, we have the many of so our ancestors uh, graveyard in the forest, but since the, the the story never been written and never been acknowledged by the local government, I think that's a real problem. But but with the many work now been done about this forest, and and that actually um, I hope that I can uh, try to save other forests in Malaysia, especially in Selangor. 
Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a couple more questions. Prof Azaki. Thank you very much. The excellent program, the peat conservation and rehabilitation in Malaysia. And so, but uh, you know that this is uh, something like a carbon neutral the strategy. And but uh, you know that peat have the very high possibility to accumulate the carbon, so which is carbon negatives. So I, I believe that one the ecosystem in, in the globally to possible to carbon negative strategy. So we developing some the technology. One is uh, the biogas, and so the same time to, to produce the biochar. This is uh, the stimulate the plant growth. Then so we success to the carbon negative strategy. For the, this conservation program is excellent, but for the next, uh, I, I recommend you to develop a new program, the carbon negatives in Petron. Uh, thank you very much for the comment, Professor Ozaki. I think, yeah, the technology is becoming available. Our alternative, how can we speed up the carbon uptake by these ecosystems, both through the natural processes, but human assisted uh, processes. I think we just have time for one more uh, question. Uh, gentleman at the back. I am uh, Kushairi. I'm a Malaysian, but uh, working in Indonesia. Uh, I'm the head of secretariat for six countries, three ASEAN countries, one Pacific Ocean countries, and one and two ocean countries. Uh, we work on the environment of these uh, six countries and my, I was to ask uh, from the presentation I heard that uh, uh, Pahang, uh, Pahang uh, indigenous people, um, most of the children are not going to school. That's what I was, I was wondering why. In, in my meeting in Geneva uh, early this year, um, the the authorities uh, from many countries were asking me what is one of, what one of your aim for the six countries. I was thinking that uh, to build a primary uh, sustainable uh, environmental school in each country for the six countries. So that is, that is one of our aims. So can, 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 can you elaborate please uh, about, the, about the actions do you take into account also of the of of the children of not going to school. Thank you. Uh, specifically on the, the issue about the uh, Pahang situation, some of the villages, I mean, the, the access and the transport to get out to the school area is, is very difficult. So this will be one of the issues looked at the overall program to try to uh, enhance the accessibility for the children from all of the school communities to go to school or to uh, develop mechanism for schooling within the community areas for those that uh, are not able to uh, travel to the school. So this will be one a part of the comprehensive uh, program. Check I like to add more. Um, one, one of the reasons uh, there's so many children, uh, indigenous children doesn't finish the school is uh, that the story of indigenous people has never been included in, in the Malaysian history books. That's the reason and, and that because um, if you if you come from uh, from the village so far away from the school and and, and the, the student already in the school come from different part of background and when they encounter this uh, new uh, children to, um, school children and they have no information about them so make them thinking who is this are they uh, no, people from different planet or something? So they have no un, uh, understanding how to respect them. And that's the reason why so many of uh, bully cases and uh, dropout cases in the school, because when they uh, face that uh, clash in, 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 um, in culture, and, and that's what uh, drove the many children, in, in, uh, especially in, in um, indigenous community, uh, um, doesn't finish the school because um, they will feel like they, they, they're not part of the uh, school, they're not part of the community. I think the, the real um, um, 
action we can do now is try to acknowledge they are part of uh, Malaysia, they are part of the children of planet. I think that's the real key message because this is very important. In, in our acknowledgement is very important to many communities, not just to indigenous people, but to many communities, especially to young, young children, because if, you, they, if they get encouragement, they will further their study. And that's actually um, something we need to do in Malaysia. With, with that note, I think I let's draw the panel session to the close. I think uh, His Royal Highness has other event in a few minutes. Uh, so um, let me just uh, give a few uh, closing remarks. So Your Royal, Your Royal Highness, the region of uh, Pahang, Crown Prince Hassanal, uh, thank you very much for gracing uh, the occasion today together with uh, uh, Tansri uh, Zakri Ham Hamid, the uh, Special Envoy of the Malaysian Prime Minister and the uh, Secretary General of the Ministry of Water and Environment, uh, Professor Zaini Ujang. Uh, thank you all participants, uh, both here in, in uh, Sharm El Sheikh as well as all of those who are online. Thank you again for uh, joining us. We've heard from a broad range of stakeholders today about the importance to work together to address uh, protection and management of peatland ecosystems. But I think a key point uh, was raised by Shat and it's um, summarized in a Malay saying, Tak kanal, tak cinta. If you don't know, you don't love. And I think uh, we need to know the peatlands, to love the peatlands. If we love the peatlands, then we realize their significant importance. Without the peatlands, the peatlands are the regulators, the key regulator, the most important regulator. On 3% of the world's land area, they have 30% of the soil carbon, more than the, the carbon in the biomass of all the world's forest. When we talk about storing carbon on the land, everyone thinks trees but most important, you should think peatland areas. But peatlands are so vulnerable to degradation, but the principle is they're also possible to restore and conserve. If we can restore the natural water level, we can bring back the vegetation and we can recover the peatlands and make them store. So I think it's very important for all of you who are here uh, to take action after you leave here to spread the message, the importance of peatlands, and to spread the message that we've heard today that action is being taken. The problems are being recognized and action is being taken and it's been demonstrated by the Pahang state government, by the uh, private sector, uh, by the indigenous community, are not waiting for some solution somewhere up in the sky. They're taking action on the ground. But this message needs to go out and need to support all over the world uh, for peatland areas to protect and also for other countries to support Malaysia and Pahang State in its effort to be a showcase of how to uh, uh, sustain and restore peatland ecosystem uh, for all of us. So with, with that I'd like to uh, thank again everyone for coming, thank the Ministry of Water and Environment for uh, hosting us uh, in the Malaysian Pavilion, thank the International Fund for Agriculture Development uh, for supporting the participation of, of some of the speakers and for everyone for, for contributing. So thank you all uh, very much and a very good afternoon and a good day to you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, to express uh, our appreciation to the panel speaker, I would like to invite uh, Tan Sri Zakri to present a token of appreciation to the speakers and as well as to take a group photo.